The gospel lesson today comes to us from the gospel according to Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verses 34 through 46. Let us hear now the word of the Lord. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply, and from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Let us pray. God, we pray that you would come over us. No, God, we pray that you would overcome us. Amen. We, again, are looking at uh, happenings, uh, teachings of Jesus, and challenges that the religious leaders of the day, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and even the Herodians, uh, had made to Jesus in the last week of his life as he has uh, entered into Jerusalem, uh, having in entered triumphantly in what we know as, as Palm Sunday uh, within the church calendar. Uh, and they are challenging Jesus and his authority. And they've asked him many questions, trying to trip him up along the way, including last week as we looked at uh, Jesus' answer to it being lawful or whether it was lawful or not uh, to pay taxes to Caesar. Uh, the Sadducees have had their shot, and now uh, the Pharisees come, and they have an expert in the law that asks Jesus this question, uh, what is the greatest commandment? Now, Jesus answers uh, what we generally as Christians know as how Jesus responds here. Uh, it's also recorded in Mark chapter 12. Uh, the, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself, that, that the law hangs, and the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. It's interesting because most of us know this as Christians, and we know this as a teaching of Jesus, but we uh, fail to understand or realize the context and the historical reality that Jesus is answering uh, from Deuteronomy. This is not an answer that Jesus just makes up on himself, by himself. Uh, it is not a um, it is not a new answer or something uh, that would have been foreign or, or somehow novel uh, for the, this expert in the law to hear. So we need to go back and, and understand the historical context of, of the Old Testament uh, and the giving of the law, in particular in the Old Testament in, within the Pentateuch, the first uh, five books of the Bible, uh, what is also known as the Torah or the law. Uh, there are two givings of the law. The law is first given in Leviticus, uh, and then the law is given in Deuteronomy. Uh, De Deuteronomy ne means the second law, the second giving of the law. In Exodus chapter 20, we have uh, the first instance of the recording of the Ten Commandments being given, but then in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 5, uh, the Ten Commandments are reiterated and instructions are given about the law. But Jesus answers not from Deuteronomy 5, but he, he answers from Deuteronomy 6. After the giving of the law this second time, these Ten Commandments, uh, we read these words. And I'm going to start in, in Deuteronomy 6, verse 1. Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 are, are kind of the, the crux of the matter, the, 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 the center of the text in what Jesus answers. And so we'll get to that. But the, the chapter, the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy uh, begins this way. These are the commands, decrees, and laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, 
and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey, so that it may go well with you, that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. So there's a lot going on here already. Um, uh, uh, Moses here is talking about uh, the giving of the law. And these laws and decrees uh, are given for a purpose. Um, not unlike right now um, in adult education, we're going through uh, spiritual disciplines. And the book that we're using is written by a gentleman named Donald Whitney. And the title of that book is Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. And he talks about the fact that that the spiritual disciplines are given for a purpose, that we may be sanctified um, and that God may work through us, through the means of grace, uh, that we may uh, in, endeavor to uh, join on this journey as God uh, remakes us, even as he has remade us. And uh, what's going on here is that uh, we have to understand that, that, the, that the law is given for a purpose. And that purpose is not... Uh, for the purpose of condemnation. I think oftentimes uh, it is easy for us inside the church in particular uh, and, and, and by um, kind of the, the extension and by the way that we talk about the gospel or we talk about the Christian life that our culture at large generally sees Christianity as a list of laws and decrees um, to follow. And that is not uh, really what the gospel is at all. Uh, the gospel really is about the fact that God loves us enough um, to provide a way uh, that we might be reconciled to him in the midst of our sinfulness. Uh, as we uh, talk about uh, when we go through the great Thanksgiving before communion every week, um, that this has proved God's love for us in this, or God's love has proved for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Um, so that is not a work of us fulfilling the law, uh, but it is what Christ has done uh, to fulfill the law on our behalf, uh, as he talks about in Romans, uh, I mean, in Matthew 5, uh, that he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. But the purpose of the law is that we might know the heart of God and that we might live according to the purposes and the ways that God calls us to live. And so that's important here. Now, uh, this text happens after the giving of the Ten Commandments, again, uh, in chapter 5. And in chapter 5, um, I just want to reiterate this, uh, well, in Exodus 20 and in, in Deuteronomy 5, when the Ten Commandments are given, uh, the first four have to do with our relationship with God. Those are known as the first table. Uh, generally, we, we break apart the, the um, Ten Commandments into two tables. The first table of uh, those having to do with our relationship with God and the second table, the six commands that have to do with uh, our relationship with one another. Uh, the first table uh, is first uh, because it is primary and because it is most important uh, that we might be reconciled to God. And only in being reconciled to God, uh, as we are who God truly made us to be, can we be reconciled uh, one to another. But it's interesting here that Jesus doesn't try to pick one out or the other out of, of any of the Ten Commandments, as, as we might be prone to do or want to do, uh, to try to answer this. But after the giving of the law, as we read this passage, then this is what happens, the words in, in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. And this, in, in, in Judaism, is known as the Shema. Shema means here. It is the first word uh, that appears um, in, in, in Hebrew and in English uh, as we have this passage. And so this is what Jesus was pointing to, the Shema. The Shema would have been recited by Jews every morning and every night. Anyone who was an observant Jew would have said this prayer at least twice a day. So Jesus is really just answering in, in, in what has become the custom uh, of Jews of the day uh, and, and throughout the centuries. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. There are a couple of things here to point out. But Jesus is, is, is being deeply theological in rooting uh, the, the law in the eternality and the character and nature of God himself. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The other thing that's important to note here is that, is that the term here uh, for uh, the possessive, um, uh, 
preposition uh, is uh, is is that is a pronoun, not preposition. The possessive pronoun is our. Our God is one that that we collectively belong to God. But then the text changes from verse four to verse five, and and that um, that possessive pronoun becomes not our but love the lord your god it speaks to both the collective or universal inclusivity of who god is that he is our god uh, collectively for all of humanity but then our response is to love the lord our god with all our heart our soul and our mind all of who we are personally and there's a reason for that there's a purpose for that it's so that things go well if you go back to Exodus, uh, before Exodus 20, as God is calling the Israelites up out of Egypt, he commands Moses uh, to tell um, to tell the Pharaoh that God is calling his people out of slavery into freedom for a purpose. And that purpose is not for the sake of freedom itself. God has not set us free merely or solely so that we would be free. Freedom is not the objective of reconciliation with God. Freedom is not the objective of salvation. And I think it's important for us to remember because oftentimes we think that that in our freedom, perhaps, we can do whatever we want to do. That's not true. Uh, Paul uh, kind of writes this or reiterates this time and time again uh, in the letter to, to Rome, to Rome, the church of Rome in Romans. Uh, does this mean that because grace abounds when we sin that we should just keep on sinning? And he says, by no means. So we don't uh, just believe that, that God has freed us for the sake of freedom so that we can do whatever we want. But but Moses said to Pharaoh, and the purpose of God is God declared his intentionality and his intentions uh, to, to Moses was to let my people go so that they may come and worship me. Worship is the right goal of our relationship with God and our reconciliation and restoration to being sinless. Now that we would be free just to do whatever we want to be do or, or, or to fulfill our own desires, but that we might be free to worship God in spirit and in truth. It recalls uh, John 4. I know there's a lot of scriptures in here, but it recalls John 4. When John says to the Samaritan woman, the well, the day is coming when you won't worship on this mountain or in, or in uh, Jerusalem, as the Jews do, but you will worship in spirit and in truth. And that is what Jesus is answering consistently with here. As he goes back to the Shema, he, he, uh, he, he intimates or he appeals to the character and the nature of God as being the Lord our God who is eternal and the character of God and that we are called as a response to who God is to love him with all of who we are. And then that sums up, that sums up the law. Because if we do that rightly, if that vertical relationship, if that first table of the Ten Commandments is being filled, then what will naturally flow from that reconciliation is that we would love one another perfectly. And that's why Jesus is able to say, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Now that sums up both tables as well. You see how that follows. That the first command really fulfills or acts as a summary to to the first table, the first four commandments, and loving your neighbor as yourself, the second. The other thing that happens is, as, as God talks about this, I want us to see and to understand that the, the nature of salvation is not something we accomplish on our own. So if you grew up in a church, like I grew up in a church, and so I thought that the purpose of me being a Christian was to fill the, fulfill the Ten Commandments, and then I felt shame and guilt when I was unable to fulfill them, we see here the purposes of God is so that in the law we might know the righteousness of God, that he would hold us to what standard, but that we would also then in the gospel of Jesus Christ see the person and work of Christ as what fulfills the law on our behalf, and then we become free as those who are able to be free to worship him based on what he has done. So listen to this. Love, uh, hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now to verse 6. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. In other words, they're not just external to us, but they change the very nature of who we are as we live them out. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. In other words, at all times, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. 
Put it everywhere. Advertise it. Don't ever forget. Remind yourself by the way that you dress and the way that you live your lives that this is what is true. Then the Lord our God, bring, when the Lord our God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards you did not plant. Uh, sorry, vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. This Sabbath land, this promised land that God brings the Israelites into is a foreshadowing actually of our salvation in Christ as he brings us to eternal life in Jesus Christ. We must remember that we should not forget the work of God, that it isn't what we've done. It would be easy for the Israelites two or three or even four generations uh, past uh, as they pass through the generations. That's why it's important to impress upon your children and their children, uh, as it says that they may remember, that they be, would begin to think that they deserve this or that they've earned this. And God says, no, this is what I've done. I have given you this land. These are things that you did not provide for yourself, but I've provided for you. Starting in verse 13, then fear the Lord your God. Serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord our God, who is among you, is a jealous God. And his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massa. Be sure to keep the commands the Lord our God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, that it may go well with you. And that you may go in and take over the good land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers, thrusting out all the enemies before you, as the Lord said. And in the future, when your son asks you, when your children ask you, when your sons and your daughters ask you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws our Lord has commanded you? Tell them, when we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us up out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible upon Egypt and the Pharaoh and his whole household. But he... Speaking of the Lord God, brought us up out of from there to bring us in and give us the land that we he promised on oath to our forefathers. The land commanded us to obey all the Lord commanded us to obey all these commands and decrees and to fear the Lord our God, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all the law before the Lord our God, He has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. Our righteousness is in recalling, it is in remembering, and it is knowing rightly who God is. And the second part, I know you probably think the sermon's almost over. We still have uh, an entire uh, other half of the scripture uh, to talk about, but but we'll do so very briefly, and this ties it up. After Jesus has answered this, um, he then asks the Pharisees that were gathered there a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? So Jesus began by appealing back to the Shema, to the character of God, the eternality of God, the personhood of God, who God is. And then he begins to question the Pharisees about who they think the Messiah is. Whose son is he? And then he says, here he quotes Psalm 110, uh, uh, one, verse 1, uh, here a, a Psalm of David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under my feet. In other words, they, they're kind of caught in a trap of, of, of talking about who the Messiah is. Is he an offspring of David or was he there before? If you'll recall earlier in the gospel, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Now, to make the I am statement is the, is the statement that God made uh, to Moses at the burning bush when Moses says, who shall I say sent me? And God says, I am that I am. And Jesus says before Abraham, who is the father of, of all the Israelites, the first Israelite, he says before Abraham was, I am. He speaks to his own character, his own personhood, and his own co-eternality with God the Father. So here he is speaking to and alluding to the salvation that he is about to bring through his arrest, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. Remember, this is all in the backdrop of the final week of Jesus' earthly life uh, as he has gone back to Jerusalem. He has set his, his gaze, he has set his countenance upon Jerusalem for the purpose of being crucified for us 
that in him we might find salvation. Amen.